Welcome everyone to this special presentation hosted by the Emerson College Alumni Association and the Washington DC Regional Alumni Chapter. I'm Ginny Van Dusen, Associate Director of Alumni Professional Development, and I'm happy you could join us tonight. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. To minimize background noise, all attendees are in listen-only mode. We encourage you to submit questions at any time during the presentation via the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window. Following the presentation, our panelists will answer your questions for as long as time permits. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Loge, Emerson class of 87, political veteran, George Washington University professor, and very active DC alumnus. Peter? Thank you very much, Ginny. Uh, on behalf of the Emerson College DC Regional Alumni Chapter, thank everybody who's joining us wherever you are around the world. Thanks for at least coming to my little part of DC. Uh, it's a political event, so it's gonna be a DC, DC alumni event. Um, we all want to encourage alumni to engage each other through these regional chapters, especially since we can't meet in person, connect with the regional chapter, connect online, find ways to reach out, uh, support each other, support emerging alumni. Uh, speaking of connecting and emerging, you should check out Emerge, which is the new online community where Emersonians can connect, share, support, celebrate each other. It's emerge, E-M-E-R-G-E dot -E, Emerson dot E-D-U, as you see in front of you. Uh, it's a terrific new tool. Check it out, see what it's all about. With that, I want to introduce uh, Raul Rice, Dean of the School of Communication at Emerson College and a professor in communication studies. Before entering academia, uh, Dean Rice was a journalist and, and an editor um, in Brazil and the US with a number of publications, magazines, television, all of it. Uh, he covered politics, sports, city news, science, the environment, and many, many other issues. He's a strong supporter of the college. I've gotten to know Dean Rice a bit over the years. Uh, he's really committed to, to an active and engaged uh, Emerson College. He, he does all of us proud. So I'm really thrilled he could join us. Uh, welcome, welcome Dean Rice. Thank you, Peter. And good evening, everyone. And welcome to the second installment of Emerson College's webinar series, Election 2020, The Road to the White House. As Peter mentioned, my name is Raul Rice and I have the honor of serving as the Dean of the School of Communication here at Emerson. It is also my honor to introduce the leader of tonight's discussion, Professor Spencer Kimball, who teaches political communication courses at the undergraduate and graduate levels here at Emerson. He is also the director of Emerson Polling and the advisor for the Emerson Pre-Law Society and the Emerson College Polling Society. Spencer holds bachelor's and master's degrees in political communication from Hartford University a master's in political management from Suffolk University, and a Juris Doctorate from the Massachusetts School of Law. As director of Emerson Polling, a role that he has held since 2014, Spencer has led the strategic and innovative rethinking of how polls are conducted, earning broad national recognition as one of the most trusted and accurate public opinion polling organizations in the country. During the primaries of the 2016 U.S. presidential race, Emerson Polling predicted the winners of 16 races in eight states, a 94% accuracy. Then during the two, uh, 2018 midterm elections, over the course of 53 polls, Emerson Polling achieved a 93% statistical accuracy and 93% predictive accuracy. So it is little wonder why Emerson polling is so often cited by organizations such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Fox News, Forbes, and many, many more. Over the past year, under Spencer's direction, Emerson polling has partnered with several other organizations such as WHDH in Boston, Nexstar Media Group, the University of Colorado, the City University of New York, our friends at Blancarna School of Communication in Spain, and several nonprofit organizations. Through this work, Emerson Polling has measured public opinion on issues such as education, public health, racial equity, and social justice, as well as electoral campaigns. In light of that broad scope, and as the Dean of the School of Communication, I'd like to point out the value of polling as a vital tool for communication. 
in order to effectively engage with and inform any audience, it is important to understand that audience's knowledge, opinions, and values. Under Spencer's guidance, Emerson Polling has helped to set new standards for public opinion research in our society. And it's truly my honor to welcome him to tonight's discussion. Spencer. Well, thank you, Dean Rice, for such kind words. Um, really appreciate the support. And I just want to hit two points before I bring in the team that I get to speak with this, this evening. And one is that polling does give the voice to the little person. Uh, everybody in our surveys, we call literally hundreds of thousands of households. We text message. We try to get as many people to give us their point of view, and that way we can share and really have a sense of public opinion. And it's also important for us to understand where people are. If we sit here and we look at the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, about four months ago, I was doing some studies in New York with the City University of New York, and they were wondering, would people go to restaurants if they opened? And once we started asking those questions, we realized behaviors had changed. And even if you opened up things, people weren't going to come. And I think it's important that we understand sometimes how behavior is going to act before we put in policies. Now, what we get to talk about tonight is the use of a subset of what I say of survey research, political polling. So we do surveys all the time of the public, but polls are specific for elections. And tonight we have a tremendous uh, group that uh, the Alumni Association has helped put together and I'd like to introduce them here. We're gonna start with my colleague, uh, Cheryl, uh, Professor Cheryl Jackson. She teaches in the journalism department. Uh, we had the chance uh, about almost a year ago to sit on a panel and discuss one year out and I'm very excited to have Cheryl with us today. We also have with us Susan Del Percio, uh, another alum from our program from a couple years ago. And uh, Susan, you'll catch her usually in the mornings on MSNBC and, uh, and elsewhere. She always has her blog and look forward to hearing her insights. And last, uh, cleaning up in the batter's box is Leo Hindry. We got a real uh, opportunity to talk to somebody who has been in the game, um, really knows politics, and understands more about uh, consumer behavior than I think he lets on. So hopefully we'll be able to pull some of those insights from him tonight. And so with that, I'd like to bring in the team and start our conversation about uh, not only uh, COVID in the election, but of course, the breaking news of what just happened two hours ago and the, not, uh, and the I guess, nomination of Senator Harris as the vice presidential um, candidate to run with Joe Biden. So if um, we have our, our panel together, I'd like to start it off and um, we will get into some of the polls, but obviously I'd like to really hear people's opinions. And I'd like to start off with Cheryl, if uh, you're available, to give us your insights as a black woman. How do you see uh, Senator Harris as a, another black woman running for the vice president and what what challenges do you see confronting her? Well, I mean, it's it's such an inspiration for women and women and girls of color, you know, all across this nation. Um, you know, she's a smart, uh, you know, in, she's an intelligent woman, uh, a woman who can handle herself in a debate with someone like Pence. But the main thing is it's part of history. And I think um, at this moment when America is burning, you know, where there's protesting in the streets and people of color and their allies are in the streets and are not going home until there's some kind of justice, it is a moment of hope to know that someone who's experienced racism, who understands it from an emotional level, could be in the White House to lead us through um, some kind of healing in America. Because as you see, it, it looks like people are not going home until there's some kind of justice. Um, I, I think that uh, some of the things that might be in the way I see as a, as a black woman, um, I wonder if there are people who will now not be able to vote for Biden because they see, uh, they're not used to seeing a black woman as a, as a VP. So I, I do, I am concerned about that. I think, um, you know, you had people who were very opposed to voting for a woman when Hillary was running, and now you have a black woman, I think when you think about maybe some of the Southern states, maybe where I'm from in Indiana, um, and where I'm very familiar with a lot of the people there, I do a lot of um, 
public speaking there and I'm very involved there. I think that, um, that a lot of people might have trouble with the transition of a black woman in this kind of office. And so I know that, you know, uh, the science says that the VP doesn't matter. I hope that her being black does not uh, get in the way of people voting for uh, Biden. Well, that's an interesting boomerang effect, almost like the Bradley effect uh, in a way. And so my, I would pivot over to Susan then and ask, do you see Harris you know, as a former prosecutor? She was always kind of ridiculed in the Democratic primary as being law and order, as somebody who could be a, attractive to moderate Republicans and be able to swing over some of the electorate. I think she will be attracted to a lot of moderate Republicans and right-leaning independents for the very reason of she, her background, the way she conducts herself at, at the hearings, at the Senate hearings, she was, uh, I'm sorry, the Kavanaugh hearings, she was fantastic. She has a lot to offer to a broad spectrum of women, which is what is appealing. And the other thing is, is I actually think it will be make more rep moderate Republicans more comfortable voting for Harris than they would Elizabeth Warren because they would be too scared about some of her policies, knowing that she could be front and center as a presidential candidate in four years. So I think this was a great pick by Biden. It's measured. Um, we know, as Cheryl said, history says the VP choice, you know, really doesn't play out in the end. I think that could be footnoted with unless Donald Trump really tries to make it, which is completely possible, unfortunately. But I think that will, again, move suburban women towards Biden-Harris and away from Donald Trump. And Leah, I want to bring you into the conversation here, because Harris, if you recall, when she was running for president, was a very good fundraiser. Um, she raised a lot of money early. Now, some of that faded, obviously, with the campaign. It was unable to sustain that type of but from your perspective, how do you see Harris benefiting the ticket? And from a financial standpoint, do you see her as being a catalyst to help raise the money that Biden will need? You know, Spencer, I think she's an extraordinary choice. <clears throat> I think that Joe was looking for somebody that he could rely on, somebody who the age difference would, would be something of importance. She's 55 years old, he's 77. And, uh, I think the connection that she had with his departed son, Bo, uh, was so tangible, so personal, that he, I think he looks at her and sees uh, a, a very close relationship developing soon. Uh, I know a lot of people think that the vice presidential choice doesn't mean much. And, and I know Peter, uh, who introduced us, believes that in some of his work. I think you, you can't draw that distinction tonight, Spencer. I think that a bunch of white men over hundreds of years uh, probably don't have much relative impact. This is an extraordinary African-American woman, 55 years old from the state of California, who showed in her various races in California, all of which were tough. Even her district attorney race in San Francisco, followed by her AG race for the state and then her statewide pick as senator. She's always been able to bring people into her plurality she doesn't, to Cheryl's comment, uh, doesn't tend to drive them away. I, I, I think Cheryl would, would be more insightful than I to some of the Midwest views that might have materialized tonight and perhaps some of the Southeast views. But I think she also, to your question about fundraising, she's formidable. Uh, I've been around her in, in fundraising capacities and she is good. Uh, she's better than Joe. Joe, Joe. Joe engages you, but Dave forgets to ask you. Uh, he, he never makes the ask. He just, you're ready to go. You got your checkbook out and he says, good night. Kamala stands by the door with her arms out saying, don't come, don't pass me without a check in hand. So I think, I think it's a great choice. I, I've known the, the vice president Biden for every, for, in fact, he and I got honorary degrees at Emerson on the same year. Here I think it was 03. Uh, he's an extraordinarily sensitive, genu genuine individual and just this picture that you and, and Jenny chose to portray their relationship is, is very moving to me. Uh, it's, it's in their eyes. And uh, I think it's a stunning choice. I couldn't be happier tonight. Now let's just throw out one more question to the group and then we'll, we'll get into some of the polls and some of the, the races. But we all recall that Harris and Biden, Harris really took on Biden in that first debate, uh, really became a focal point in the race early on. 
Um, eventually it didn't work. How do you see that playing out as far as a partnership? Because obviously there was some animosity, or at least it appeared that way, and now they are a team. And does that speak to a larger message that the Democrats are going to try to put out? I don't, Pitt Spencer, my answer is I, I, th I think it was a big oopsie. I, I think it was tactical, and she made a mistake. Uh, <clears throat> she, uh, she doesn't hold animus to Joe Biden. She, uh, she was running against a crowded field. And I think she was standing, trying to stand out and move into that higher rank and uh, probably got ill-advised, ill-advised. Um, I you know, completely disagree uh, as far as the oopsie moment goes. I think it showed who she was and she was out there to fight. And it, I don't, she shouldn't regret it. I think that she went for, for a win, which is exactly what you want from a running mate, someone who wants to win. I think it's, they were able to get uh, past it, which is a great reflection on Joe Biden and a re nice reflection on Senator Harris. But at the end of the day, it's kind of funny how the, the Trump team came out with some criticism trying to say of, of the uh, choice, saying Harris was once critical of Biden. Well, if you look at all the people who have worked for Donald Trump, I don't think any of them actually endorsed him before he was the nominee. As a matter of fact, many spoke against him, except for the one person he got rid of, Jeff, Jeff Sessions. So I don't think that's going to be an argument that will stick when you look at Donald Trump's record. I, I feel like, too, that the fact that they both have kind of, you know, they've come together shows that they're not going to be grudge holding like you often see Trump. And he's always talking about what he won't forget when someone you know, offends him. And so I think it kind of speaks to a, a quite, you know, sort of a gentler nature. Um, you know, Trump's already called Kamala a nasty woman, you know, already today. So I think that um, it seems like that, that they can come together. And I, I've heard that um, Obama and Biden disagreed a lot and they were able still to be remain friends. And so maybe this is that kind of thing he said he was looking for, uh, hopefully. Time will tell, and obviously uh, next week at the conventions, they'll have their moment to really um, show off the, the ticket and see if it's a, a winning dynamic. So let's uh, jump to the next slide, and we'll start looking at some of the uh, poll results. And we're going to kind of pause as we look at it, because I'd like to talk with the group about each region of the country. And so we start up in Minnesota, and Minnesota was a state that Clinton wins by a point and a half much tighter race than a lot of people expected. And if we look at the whole Midwest, you notice you've got Iowa, Wisconsin, Michigan, all of these states that will, what we've seen over the last 10, 20, 30 years is a population drop. We're watching a shift down into the Sun Belt. And as we look at Minnesota, we see a, a tight race. Um, Joe Biden's got a three point lead, which is within the polls margin of error. And as we look around the rest of that Midwest area, we see a lot of tight races. And we know that this was kind of that blue wall. I throw it to the panel. Uh, who would like to pick it up and talk about some of those Midwest states, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, Minnesota? Is there a couple that the Democrats think that they can take back, such as Michigan? Or is there some that they are giving up on as Ohio? Any thoughts on, on some of these races? Well, I think when you look at the, when you look at the turnout results of 2016, that's important when looking at Michigan and Wisconsin. They, uh, Hillary Clinton performed in uh, double-digit numbers worse than uh, Barack Obama, whereas Trump basically did somewhat better than uh, Romney in Michigan and a handful of voters in, in Wisconsin. But when you look at Minnesota, now this is an interesting race because like you said, it was a point and a half difference final. This traditionally would be a state that Trump would make a play for. Pre-coronavirus, he would have been strong there right now. You would have seen him spending money. The problem Donald Trump has is he can't, def he has to defend so many other states like Michigan and Wisconsin. Michigan, they've basically written it off. So where can he play in the Midwest? Now this says he can play here. Ohio, the polling right now shows that there may be a potential for Biden and Biden's making a big play right now in advertising. So their internal polling shows that that's, uh, 
that that could go his and way. That would make sense to jump into because if you had, no Republicans ever won the presidency without winning Ohio. Right. And Ohio is just it's a it's an interesting state because of how it's reacted to the the, the impact the coronavirus has had on it, COVID nineteen. But at the end of the day, and Ohio actually is the, one of the states that on their prime they moved their primary right. uh, Republican yes. governor. So they are also very comfortable voting by mail. They have it's it's been there a long time. They are very comfortable in that space. So I think the other thing that probably Biden's seeing in Ohio and probably even in Minnesota is when you know you have these wonderful public polls, Spencer. But when I'm working, I look at private polls. And when I look at the private polls, I see the head to head and I say, that's nice. I say, where are my gettable votes? How can I go get some? And that's what Trump did in 2016 so successfully, especially in Pennsylvania. I think Biden's looking at the same picture. Um, we'll know uh, in a couple of weeks, actually, to see if he could break away in some of these states. But right now, I think that Biden sees that this is a gettable state. Um, Hillary won it before. A lot of the Midwest for, is, is gettable for him, especially if he could change the turnout models. So he should be playing hard here. What do we think, Leah? Well, we've talked in the past about jobs in the Midwest and you know, code words for you're gonna lose your job. And you know, we've talked about you know, that impact on voters. Do you see a Biden policy that's gonna be maybe a little, uh, not as far to the left um, as the Democrats have gone in the past to try to you know, make peace with those voters? You know, I think there, there's two things going on in the Middle West. The, the tariffs uh, clearly had greater impact in the Middle West than the rest of the country, uh, both for the good and, and for the bad. If you're a soybean farmer, uh, you, you had a pretty bad experience with tariffs. If you, if you were a steel worker for a while, you thought you had a pretty good outcome. At the end of the day, uh, I think when Joe runs in the Middle West, you're going to see, and, and I'm anxious to hear what Susan thinks, but you're, you're going to see a lot of broken promise ads that uh, Trump promised an awful lot of things to the Middle West. And uh, the, the quality, I, I watch both uh, the campaigns directly and the United, Unite the Country, which is the super PAC, and they both lean on promises broken. And I think that uh, Ohio is going to be very tough. It's just with Mike DeWine having done a nice job as, as governor uh, in, on top of the, of the coronavirus, uh, Ohio will be tough. Minnesota, Michigan, very strong. And uh, the bro Broken Promises ads will play particularly well in Michigan. I think in Indiana, too, where I'm from, I, I think the Broken Promise ads, you know, we have farmers, we had uh, we have, you know, uh, manufacturing jobs and uh, in Columbus, Indiana, as I always say, I'm from the same hometown as Mike Pence, uh, Cummins Engine Company is a Fortune 500 company that has employed everybody's parents for so many years uh, because of tariffs has laid off people and um, is failing to some degree at this point. And so um, I did see an ad when I was home of a farmer standing in the field uh, talking about, yeah, I'm losing my farm, but honestly, I think there's a Trump has a bigger vision, so I'm still going to vote for him. So, um, but I, I do think the Broken Promise ads um, should fly in Indiana as well because a lot of people are struggling. You know, it was actually Indiana where when those results, because Indiana poll results come out first usually. Obviously, this year I think it's going to be a lot different. But traditionally, it was Indiana that would come out. And I remember watching those returns, and we expected Trump to win the state by 10, 11 points. That thing got up to 19, 20 points kind of raised an eyebrow of, you know, things to come that night. But um, so that Midwest area, you, you, as a group, you think it's fertile ground for the Democrats to be able to take back uh, some of those states that Trump won. But on the flip side, it seems Trump is still competitive, at least in some of the key states like Iowa, Ohio, um, that he obviously has to hold um, if he's to be reelected. But it's a sine qua non for each of them, Spencer. Uh, Joe needs to do well in the Middle West uh, to Cheryl's comment, uh, Trump needs to recreate what he did last time. So let's jump over to Pennsylvania. We come over here to the Northeast. Pennsylvania, to me, was the keystone state of the 2020 election, uh, 2016 election. When we saw those 20 electoral votes go, it was almost, you know, you could see the blue wall was, was you know, broken. Um, do you see Biden being a home state, being able to pull back uh, Pennsylvania? As you can see in our numbers, we have it about nine points. 
This is similar to where Clinton was back in July and early August, uh, looking back at those polls of 2016, only to see the race tighten over the last 12 weeks. Uh, interested to hear your perspectives on where you see Pennsylvania and how are they going to get out a larger vote and does Harris impact that, that vote? You know, I think, I think Hillary forgot that Pennsylvania, Spencer, is two states. It's east and west. And, and she killed them in the east and got slaughtered in the west. Uh, Joe is way too advised, way too thoughtful. Scranton Joe is not going to make that mistake, I promise you. And uh, Leo Gerard and, this, and Tom Conway from the Steelworkers are all in for Joe in the West. And, and that'll be dispositive. And the East, will, he'll be fine. Uh, the choice tonight of, of, of Senator Harris will, will actually cement the East, uh, I think. And Cheryl would know better. But I think it'll do well in the East because of the choice tonight. Cheryl, what do you think? I agree with him. I agree with him on that. Um, I, I kind of see things a little different. <laughs> um, not surprising. Um, and that's why you're on this panel. <laughs> and, not, and the reason why is because Hillary Clinton did what Barack Obama did in 2016. She hit the number she had to hit. The um, thing that was so surprising about Pennsylvania were all the voters that Trump was able to in, get involved and actually go vote. Those were the voters who, the, who were the forgotten voters, people would say. Not the uncounted, because the polls actually got it right. But they were the ones who people didn't see starting to vote again. And he registered a lot. And he has spent a lot of time in the last four years, especially in a state like Pennsylvania, mining for new voters. Now, and he's been successful. He's registered a lot of Republican voters. And I think that this race is going to tighten up, especially when you look a little deeper into this poll, Spencer, where I believe that, I think it's a 30-some, thir you know, 5% believe that they are better off than they were four years ago. That's a huge number given everything that's in play. So I, I think that Biden should win the state, but I don't think it's going to look anywhere like that number. I think, it's go I think he will win, but I think you're looking within 3 4%. Me, you know. Hopefully he wins, in my opinion. <laughs> no, I would agree. For three to three or four, three or four. I agree, it's not going to be nine, but three or four is a clear win versus sixteen. That's right. Uh, that was a forty thousand vote um, jump. But we did ask that question in the survey, and it was interesting to see across the board. Even though living in during this pandemic, a plurality in every state said that they were doing financially better off than they were four years ago. And that's obviously the Ronald Reagan famous line from 1980 that put him or some would say helped him, you know, win that that election or, or frame it to say, why are we voting um, on our economic principles? But if we dig a little bit deeper into the, the East, particularly the Northeast, just want to get your opinion about, uh, let's just say the state of Maine in uh, the second district. So we all know that if Trump was to lose Pennsylvania and Michigan, that puts him at 270, but that's still enough to win. It's that second district of Maine that put him over the 269, that one electoral vote. Polling out there has been very, very tight. Um, do you see the candidates? Do you see the second district of Maine? And we'll jump back to the Midwest, the second district of Nebraska as kind of battlegrounds that you'll see candidates spending more time in than we've traditionally seen. I think you'll find the airplane is up more often in Maine than it is in Nebraska. You see, um, yeah, I mean, I think I think Maine is all about the Senate race and, and whose okay. whose tails uh, get dragged along. If Susan should win, Susan Collins should win, then then Trump would be doing by by definition, he, he may be able to salvage Maine. If she goes down, uh, he goes down. Yeah, to your point, that is the theme that came out of the 2016. Any states that Trump won, the Republicans won the Senate. Any states that Clinton won, the Democrats won the Senate. And it'll be interesting to see, as you mentioned, if Collins is to lose to Gideon up in Maine, will all of a sudden Trump lose that second district? That's another vote. Uh, same thing with Michigan. You know, there's a Senate race there with um, John James trying to, 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 to win. Um, right. Tough race. Um, all right, let's jump over. So oh, go ahead, Susan. For a second. Think about it this way. All Biden really has to do is win Michigan and Florida. He could keep the map the same. 
He can lose Pennsylvania. He could do everything. Mm -hmm. Everything can be the same. Michigan, which they've everyone has pretty much conceded, especially the Trump team, he's lost. Florida is very competitive. So, you know, that's why when you talk about like what states, like for example, is the Midwest in play? Well, it depends on resources. How much can he put there or does he want to put in Florida, for example? There's a lot of strategic decision making that has to go on, which is why I think they did this big buy in Ohio to see if they could move the numbers and get something going. That way they know if they can't do it now, they probably won't be able to in another month or, and they will focus more on a state like Florida and maybe even some money in Maine. I don't, I don't think, Susan, it, it's a money issue. I, uh, I, I don't have any sense that the campaign on the Biden side will be short, short of resources with Hawkfish which is the Bloomberg Initiative helping the Super PAC, helping Spencer. Uh, the, days, the days of looking at, in the Koch brothers' dust, those are gone. I think mad money will matter when you're looking to play in a lot of big money uh, media markets that could be important. You only have some- I think money's important. I just think I'm suggesting the Biden campaign will be short of money. Oh no, I wasn't suggesting that they would be short of money. I'm just saying there's always, fiscal economic decisions being made in a campaign as to where to spend the money. And sometimes you say, it may be, I may be able to win this state, but I know if I put more effort into it, this other one, I can get it. So you make a stronger bet. There aren't yeah, unlimited yeah. resources. There's plenty of them. You just have to choose how to spend the money. I think the phrase fire hose comes to mind. They're going to spray the nation. Well, well, Bloomberg, we saw Bloomberg do that in the primary. Uh, and hmm. he didn't win, but he was up at viability very quickly. So uh, things had been different. So uh, money definitely has an impact. I think advertising clearly. Um, and, and Cheryl, from your perspective uh, as a journalist, how do you see them reporting on, on this race when you have you know, a candidate like Trump who's so non-traditional in his style and delivery and, you know, Journalists have been struggling with this now for four and a half years. Do you see any change in this election from that perspective? I think the, the big problem is as a journalist is trying to figure out, you know, how to report him when, you know, um, he has so many people convinced that the media is all fake news. And so people, you know, it seems like there's a fair amount of people that believe when he says that the media has worked together to create some kind of narrative and, and it, it seems that, um, you know, anytime that people press against him, sort of his followers are like, this is fake news. And, and um, I think that trying to convince people that the media is made up of people of different races, different ages, different religions, different backgrounds, they're not conspiring together. They're not on a team. They're not, um, you know, in a gang. They don't, you know, work together to conspire. But Trump has convinced he has convinced a fair amount of people that they cannot trust the media. So um, I think that's the media challenge. I remember I was on a panel and I'm trying to think, I think it was, I was with, with someone um, who worked at MSNBC and she was saying that um, at some of his rallies, he wouldn't even let the media turn around and shoot the audience so that he could say the audience was bigger or that they wouldn't shoot the audience, you know? So um, always trying to get around his antics uh, is surprising. It's, a, it's surprising that, um, the people that you think that you know as, as reasonable are saying uh, they're kind of buying into this idea that the media is fake. And so I think that the big deal is just to keep telling the truth and trying to really trying to negotiate with people who um, are not really skilled on how to fact check, you know, so it's a, it's just, a challenge. I just have one question to ask Cheryl, if I may. Cheryl, how, how hard is it to report when you constantly also have to fact check a candidate. I mean, that, and that causes some of the, when you know, Trump says fake news. So when you question like it's, you know, the sky is not purple today, Mr. President, it's, you know, gray. And these are facts. And I wonder the, if that challenge that journalists have, if for example, it spills into the debates, like how do you fact check during a debate and et cetera. And how important now that we live in these media silos is getting it right and how do how do voters really learn these days 
Well, I think the media has now become also the meme that's generated out of a 15 year old's basement, you know, or somebody creating content that, you know, has a, a side agenda. And so now the media is discredited in a lot of ways because like you said, we're in these big groups of people that are also not, not necessarily people who went to Emerson and studied journalism, but people who are creating content. And so uh, fact checking, I mean, I, I, I do have a sort of a, a following of people who, uh, you know, believe a lot of those kinds of conspiracies. And so some of the people I work with, <clears throat> excuse me, at Emerson or some of my students are like, why are you wasting your time trying to convince people that this is not true? And I think that I think people are kind of ignorant about how to fact check. And so um, I think fact checking someone all the time is more difficult because we expect people in that kind of station to come at least with the truth um, as they see it at least, you know, something that we can check. But uh, we're constantly fact checking uh, Trump and, you know, student reporters um, sometimes have to be reminded over and over again to fact check him because something sounds true, but you don't know. And so it's a, it's a different kind of challenge, I think, for journalists today. Well, let's jump out of the Northeast and or the North and let's go down to the South because this is an area where we were just talking about Florida. You know, there's a state where Trump literally moved from New York to Florida to become a resident in some way, I think, to help his electoral success down there. We have um, in North Carolina, very competitive race um, within two points with Trump. This is a race where Biden thinks that he could take it. Um, do you see the Harris pick helping in North Carolina? I'll throw that out. Um, I, I don't, I don't. I mean, I, I think we're still talking about the South. Right now, you know, the nation's- in So it's still boomerangs is what you're saying, Sharon. I, 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 do, I do, I think, it's, I think yeah. it's a challenge. You know, even when she was running for office, she was having trouble in the South, you know? So uh, there are still people that are having trouble with the idea of a black person, let alone a woman, uh, being a VP pick. So I think that is one of the things they're going to have to negotiate because I think um, I, do you I see, Do you see this carrying over to like Georgia? I mean, there's another state in the South where uh, from a registration standpoint, the Democrats have done very good work of registering African Americans and uh, Latinos and Caucasian enrollment is down about 50,000. So you got to think that state, I'm interested, would you find that to be in play or do you think same type of impact? I think North, Car North Carolina, Spencer, I, I would modestly disagree with your conclusion of 4846. Uh, Cal Cunningham is running an interesting race against Tom Tillis. Roy Cooper stood up strong uh, on, on the coronavirus, and it's coming back to compliment him. Uh, it's one of the hot spots right now in North Carolina, and uh, Roy's come through that well. Uh, I, I gotta, my gut just tells me that even with Kamala joining the ticket, that Biden could take North Carolina by a nudge. All right, and just to follow up on how we said in 2016, where Clinton won, Democrat Senator won. Well, in this case right now, when you're looking at the polling, which I believe is, is makes sense that it's spot on. I mean, it is, it is a tough state for, for both sides to pull off. But Tillis is down. The Republican senator is down. In this poll. In a, That's right. Poll. The, the and points, it, same thing, uh, Cooper, the, I mean, uh, yeah, Cooper, the governor, yeah. is up it's, as well. So it's and, an and, I, and for that reason, Susan, I would, I would have, the fact that Roy's up and Cal's up, I'd have bumped the 46 up. Well, okay, but I, I can't bump up the numbers because that's the poll and those are the results and that's what I'm looking at right now. And I don't think- well, Spencer and I have a deal. <laughs> if I don't like the results, we change them. Oh, I didn't know we could do that. We okay. just poll again. Um, but when you, when you look at that, that does show, it shows that I think that this is gonna be a hard fought out race and I think that Biden has a good shot at it, especially given the economy right now, even though people say in that poll as well, they're better off today than they were four years ago. I think Biden just may be able to pull this off, but I, I think we're gonna, this is gonna be one of the races since I think 75% of the people said they're gonna vote by mail in this poll. Um, I think we may not know the results until around Thanksgiving. 
Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, just Leo, we did ask a follow up there and you see those undecideds, they were breaking for Biden almost two to one. So you do that have makes, a that you 50, have a tight race. That um, makes 52 48. That's good. Yeah. You know, so you're right in the, um, you know, but I, you know, a lot, lots at play in North Carolina, right. a lot in the South. Um, but the, it'll be interesting to see how the, the Harris pick in, in the poll results play out over uh, you know, the next couple of weeks. Can I ask uh, Cheryl a question? Cheryl, uh, we, we, Spencer mentioned Georgia, and then I sort of interrupted and got you back on North Carolina. What do you think happens in, in Georgia with or without uh, Kamala? I mean, with Ka Kamala, I'm, a, I'm afraid that in the, specifically in the South, I'm afraid it's, it's a problem everywhere. I think it's, it's a, being a Black woman, I just feel like there are some people that are going to have to have some paradigm shifts to be able to actually, um, you know, accept her. But I do think that she is uh, someone who um, can actually lead that. I mean, I think that she has what we call the ability to code switch so well that I think that maybe um, that, that's one reason I think she's a great pick. But I do think um, we're kind of fooling ourselves if we believe that everyone's cool with a, a black woman as a VP pick. I just don't think that's true. Is that influenced by Stacey Abrams results last time? Oh, I don't know. No, I just, it's just my, it's just, it's my just the vice president yeah. aspect. Thank you. The, um, we'll jump over to the West, but I do want to just, you know, point out Texas could be an interesting state uh, out of the, whatever, 36 congressmen, you know, seven are retiring, all are Republicans. Maybe they're up to give somebody else another chance, or maybe tides are turning in Texas. Um, It'll be an interesting state to watch. But let's go out west, more to Leo's area of the world. And uh, we were looking at Arizona. Arizona, I think, voted for Clinton in 96 in a plurality vote. But now we're seeing, and we saw uh, Clinton in 2016 up early in September. Remember, she gets the endorsement from the newspaper, um, first Democrat to be endorsed in over 100 years. And now we see um, Biden, and we also have a, another Senate race down here. We have Senate races in Georgia that we didn't talk about, but here we also have the Kelly McSally uh, Senate race. So uh, Kelly, uh, Kelly, what do we Kelly, think out there? Well, Kelly's a real horse. I mean, he is a tremendous candidate. He, he's so good that he's doing fundraising outside of Arizona right now for non-Arizonan candidates. And uh, I mean, that's a sign of, of a lot of confidence uh, great family story with his wife and, and uh, her courage. Uh, I think I think Joe takes Arizona. Other thoughts on um, what about on the uh, the down the ballot? So you have Kelly. If Kelly takes the Senate, Joe takes Arizona. There's your elec eleven electoral votes. I out of there. It, it's still tough. I mean, I think it's a real race. I think Kelly is is doing a tremendous job. I don't. I don't think in this particular case, Kelly carries Biden necessarily, his success, but because Arizona is just a really, it's a, it can be, I mean, I'll, re, I'll defer to Leo, but it can be a tricky state. And I think it's one of those where Biden should put in the resources because it could be a huge turn. So like, for example, when you say Texas, like I say, forget Texas, win Arizona. That's more viable. Texas is extremely expensive. It is not a done deal. It, it's, it's what, you know, Democrats say it's like kind of Republicans with Pennsylvania um, before Trump. And so I, I think it's going to be a tough race, but a viable, a viable state for Biden. We'll know more. Again, we have to see how things tighten. There's a lot of ups and downs that are going to happen between now. I mean, we're still pre-convention. Um, we, we have to for the, a state like this, October is going to be very important. One of the things, Spencer, that one of the things, Spencer, that I'd I'd love to hear from Cheryl and and Susan and yourself on uh, when the when the when the cycle started, the Democrats thought they might be lucky to get the third Senate seat. Now you're hearing numbers like five up, and uh, I, Susan's very good at this. I, whenever I listen to her on MSNBC. Is, is it probable that the Senate side will drag up the presidential side? Or is it the presidential side that's causing the five flips from oh, the Senate I think, side? I mean, when you look at who's getting hurt and how they're getting hurt, 
Um, I think you look at Susan Collins, that's all Trump. That is Trump, 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 Trump. When you look at Colorado and Cory Gardner, there's a mix there, but that's a lot of Trump going on there too. Um, he's had, also he, a great candidate in Hickenlooper. Yeah, he's a great candidate, but more than Hickenlooper being a good candidate is the complete dislike and letdown of Cory Gardner. He is a complete failure in a lot of people's minds there. He is, I had someone who's worked in, in Colorado for a long time said, basically, I, he doesn't even know why um, Mitch, uh, Mitch McConnell's putting money into it. And I said, desperation. Um, Tillis is, is a toss up right now. I, I don't know how it breaks. And then you have Alabama and Doug Jones. I think that's a loss just in a presidential year to think you could hold on to Alabama. That's a little bit of a pipe dream. So and I, then you got Steve Bullock up in Montana. You got, and that's, that's a possible pickup too. Um, McSally is, a, is a, a loss. So now you pick up Arizona. At the end, I still think, I don't think they'll pick up five or six. I think they can get to 51 and that would be a significant win. Well, but majority is significant. Yeah, um, I mean, getting yeah. to 51 would be huge. I don't think they're going to run the board. At, at this moment in time, as we know, these polls are a snapshot. I just, I don't have a, a you know, a crystal ball to say with this president, who knows what could happen. And so, well, I, have a, I have a question. I, I mean, like someplace like Arizona is the way they're ha handling COVID-19, is that going to then uh, affect these polls and, and how, Trump, how Trump's managing that? And of course, the governor. Well, I'll say this, uh, Cheryl, on that point is Doug Ducey, the governor of Arizona, had the lowest <laughs> approval rating of all of the governors we asked about. So whatever he's doing out there doesn't seem to be popular. Um, and, and we had Republican and, and Democratic governors in other areas. So um, it's interesting to see if he's gonna actually pull down because he was a very strong candidate uh, last cycle when he was running. Um, you know, because cinema, cinema took the Senate race, he was able to hold the, the governor by considerable points. So interesting to see his numbers. And to your point directly, maybe things aren't so good in Arizona. Well, and it also seems like he's kind of taken Trump's playbook as far as just saying, everything's fine, you know, we're gonna be good, you know, don't worry about a thing. And, and uh, people aren't buying it. So. Well, to that, and to your point, as far as journalism goes and the reporting goes, and, and do you see there, he is in a whole lot of trouble because they're really not, it's been in the media now, it's starting to creep out there. He is not reporting, he's slowing down the tests and then taking a delay in reporting them as a way to, I don't know, fool people that things are going getting better. I mean, I think when we, the, the real test is whether it's looking at the Senator Trump is where are kids come October and November? Yeah. If they are in school, then that is helpful to the president and the Republicans. If they are at home, and that means parents are still at home, people are still unemployed, that's the difference between this race and the race Trump ran in 2016. He ran on fear and mongering and lies and distortion in 2016, but you didn't feel it, like it wasn't in your house. Whereas now, he's running the same kind of campaign, but you can't fool people that they, they don't have a paycheck or they can't fool people that they're teaching their children by remote learning. These are things that, or they're taking care of a sick relative or they know someone who is sick or someone who died in a nursing home. These are things you cannot hide. They are harsh realities. And that is really, at, tell me where kids are in school on, and, on October 15th and I'll tell you where the election goes. Well, they won't be playing football in the Big Ten. <laughs> no, they will not. And um, uh, we got so many things that we would like to cover. Um, I've got, we did ask a lot of those questions about school, should it be open? And it is such a partisan divide in this country regarding who, uh, who wants the children back. Republicans want them back in school. Democrats want to keep them home. How are you going to vote in this election? Democrats are going to vote by mail. Republicans are voting uh, in person. It's a very interesting time as we can see behaviorally how these partisanship is really driving behaviors. Um, and we actually have a question. I know we're, we're coming to the end of the hour. 
Um, so I, I'll pop up a few of these from the, the Q&A from the audience. This one is for Cheryl about uh, Senator Harris's racial mix. We've talked a little bit about it, um, particularly in the South. Uh, one of our, our viewers would like to know a little bit more on helping or hurting. Um, and I think you've mentioned that you think it actually might hurt the Biden ticket more than help in that region of the, the country. Uh, I think I do. I think there are, there are certain parts of the Midwest and the South where, um, and I, I'm just speaking from experience and reporting for so much of my life there, um, and also still being connected to. I mean, I'm I'm a woman who's half white. I mean, half of my my white family is still going to vote for Trump. So I'm I'm just saying that I think that some of those people. Um, I think about, um, I don't know if I should say this out loud, but I have a cousin who was outraged by the, by the looting at the protests, as she should be. But that was the very first post she had. She never said one thing about George Floyd dying in the streets. So outraged by uh, Black people looting, which is sort of a stereotypically an expected thing. And then no comment about um, George Floyd dying in the streets. And so this I know for sure. These are some very good people with, you know, I think closed minds, uh, but I don't know. I mean, I think Kamala is someone who, like I said, um, code shifts very well. So I think maybe she might be able to um, pull some of these people over. But um, in my hometown, in Columbus, Indiana, um, few things seem to have changed as far as uh, whether or not they're going to vote for Trump Pence. So, and that's the people close to me too. Thank you, Cheryl. So uh, we're coming to the end, and I think I'd like to have our uh, Jimmy Carter moment where I don't want to know what's in your heart, uh, in your mind, but what's in your heart, what you're lusting. What do you really think from each one of you, what's going to happen over the next 12 weeks? We're going to sit here today in 12 weeks. There'll be an election, God willing. And what is your gut? What's your guts telling you? Uh, Cheryl, why don't we start with you? And we'll um, I, I'm concerned that uh, mail-in voting might be interfered with the way that uh, the uh, new postmaster is, is interfering with the holding mail and not giving overtime and those kind of things. So I'm concerned that somehow uh, Trump may be able to hij hijack the election by that. I'm concerned that's going to happen. I'm concerned that we're not going to have a, a candidate, you know, shortly after the election. And then I'm mostly concerned that the the last few weeks that Donald Trump is in office, that anything can happen uh, because th this is the end of his power if, if he loses. The most concerned I am is that he becomes president again. I mean, I really don't know if America can take uh, the dog whistling the, of, of racists and the fighting in the streets and the, you know, the protesting for justice. And he just is a leader that is divisive. And so, um, but I'm hoping that uh, Biden is elected and that we can start a path of healing and, you know, um, getting over some of the things we've been going through for the last four years. But I'm terrified that, <laughs> that we may not. So. Leo, why don't you give us your gut from the left? <laughs> give my gut from the far <laughs> left. The, uh, <clears throat> you know, playing off of Cheryl's comments, which I moved me, uh, I, I think Joe's going to win. I think we're going to take back the Senate. I think Nancy keeps her majority. And the day that happens, I will thank God. And then I'll cry because this country will have been split in two. Uh, I, I do think Joe will win. And I think the animus that's developed in the other half of the population that I don't understand is, is immutable at this point. And, uh, you know, Barack had to fix an economic problem. Trump, uh, Joe has to fix an economic problem, a health care problem, a health issue problem, and this, this cleaving of half of our country away from the other half. There are parts of the United States where I can't comfortably go. I can't talk openly about my beliefs and my politics, and, and I just think it's sad. I, uh, it's the saddest, that's the legacy of Donald Trump is he, uh, he's just destroyed civility in this country. And Cheryl talked about it better than I did. Thank you. Susan, bring us home. Well, I think we are back, we are going to come to a very, we think it's hard now. I think come 
that mid-October, end of October, we are going to see an even worse recession. I think that unemployment's going to go back through the roof. I think a lot of businesses that were able to kind of grunt through this last couple of months will not be able to survive that long because we will see, I don't know if it's going to be the end of the first wave or the beginning of the second wave of the coronavirus, plus we're going to have flu season. This is going to be, and with all of that, I think it leads to a lot of economic confusion in the stock market. I think this could be an, the absolute worst time for our country in decades. And we're not uniting to fight it. We're dividing. And while I think, I, I'm very concerned, and I have been talking about this for months, about the mail service and, and what Cheryl brought up, I do think the states will seek to have their elections counted and run properly. And I hope and I believe that Joe Biden will end up being the winner. But what he will have to face, as Leo said, add the, to that the, the, where the country is now on moving, you know, hopefully in, in great strides on social injustice. And that has so many positive things going for it. And yet it's also what Donald Trump will use to divide us. And that clash is, I think, going to be so difficult. On the, on the plus side, anyone who supported Trump will go down with his ship. And I'm very happy to see those Trumpists go. So that's all. I, that's the only silver lining. They well, will go down with the ship. Coming up to the end, we'll bring back Ginny, uh, if there's any questions that we've missed. Uh, yeah, we actually have another question that had come in. Uh, a question about where is the Bloomberg money he promised? How much of an impact will it make? It's in something called Hawk, H A W K, Hawkfish. And uh, it's doing an, a, a better than okay job in social media. And it, it's just moving to streaming uh, aspects of the offerings. And uh, you'll see it to Susan's point uh, as we draw into, you, you won't, see, Labor Day's going to start messing us up here pretty soon. Post Labor Day, post conventions, you'll see a lot of hawkfish money. But he's not meeting the promises that he originally met, you know, said he would. He's investing it in different things and different. Yeah, and he's not, he's not investing in the people that he said he would, Susan. Right. Uh, right. All, all those women and men that we thought would be retained. Uh, have not been substantially. But in all fairness, he is putting it into other things like Americans for Gun Safety and other um, organizations that have great ground troops. So, but it's not going to where he said it would directly. Beats a poke in the eye. <laughs> Give you the inside dope here. So, yeah, that's the inside dope right there. <laughs> all right. Well, I think part of what happened tonight is that. Um, you all were asking each other all the questions um, that our attendees wanted to, wanted to know. So thank you for doing that. Um, panelists, I wanna thank you for your time tonight. Um, Cheryl, Susan, Leo, Spencer, fantastic job as always. A big thank you too to Peter Loge, Dean Rice, uh, for all of your time tonight and your insights. Um, and thanks to all of you attendees for being here. Uh, you'll see on the screen right now, we've got a couple, three URLs that might be of interest. Emerson.edu slash alumni is where you can find out all about Emerson Alumni Association events, virtual at this point. Uh, Emersonpolling.com if you want some more, uh, some more meaty information from Spencer and the gang. There's lots to talk about. And then finally, emerge.emerson.edu is the link to our new online platform to connect Emersonians with each other and with current students. Uh, be sure to save the dates for the next presentations in this series, September 9th, September 29th, excuse me, and November 2nd. We'll be looking at, taking a look at what's happened post convention, talk about the upcoming debates and turn an eye toward election day. A link to register for those events will be in the event survey that you'll all be receiving shortly. Again, thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks to our panelists and speakers and have a great evening.